Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Today we have one of my favorite people, a catalyst for change, Helen thomas Dotter. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, you actually ran as a candidate for president of Iceland. You were the co-founder, a key founder of Reykjavik University in Iceland. And tell me a little about your background rather than I tell you things you already know. <laughs> tell our audience about uh, the fact that you were named one of the 150 women who shake the world by Newsweek. Yeah, and maybe that's a good thing for some and other people get afraid. <laughs> well, I'm born and raised in Iceland, but I was lucky enough to be an exchange student in the U.S. when I was 17 years old, and that really did impact my life and led me to decide to educate myself in this country. So I've actually had the pleasure of living and working in lots of different parts of the United States. I went to Auburn University. I managed the men's soccer team at Auburn University. <laughs> that's how I got through uh, my education. And I did uh, live here in the Southwest. I lived in Phoenix. I did my MBA and, and did several years in corporate America before returning home and, and deciding to uh, be part of a long history of w strong women in Iceland who have impacted our country in very positive ways. Well, let's look at that history because mm. uh, in 1975, on your mom's birthday, mm. there was a women's strike. Talk mm. to me about that. It was a very unique experience because I was only seven. And on this day, women in Iceland, whether they held professional jobs or worked at home, decided to do no work, to go on a strike. And they literally brought the country to its knees. Nothing worked in Iceland that day because when women are not at work, nothing works. And this impacted me a lot as a seven-year-old. And I think it was the day I started um, to matter or to decide to matter and make a difference. I didn't understand why women would need to strike to show that they mattered. And five years later in Iceland, there was an election. Yes. Um, we were the first country to democratically elect a woman as a president, Madam Vigdis Fimpoadotir, in the year 1980. And I think the women's strike had a lot to do with that, that she got elected. And she has, of course, been a great role model to me and my generation. And I'll never forget, as an 11-year-old girl, watching her on the campaign trail. She was one woman running against three men. And in one of the campaign meetings, she was asked, because she was also she was a single mom, and she was a breast cancer survivor. So she was asked in a meeting once, um, how are you going to be president? You're a woman, and who's going to take care of hosting the parties? And people were asking her questions like that. And then one um, male. rather yeah, male asked her, uh, not just are you a woman, you're sort of a half a woman, referring to the fact that she had had one breast removed. And that's when she responded so elegantly and took the high road and said, well, I, my intention is to lead the nation, not to breastfeed it. Brilliant. Absolutely wonderful. I believe this is when she won. And since she was elected, mm -hmm. the first woman democratically elected leader, head of state, how many others? There have been dozens of other women heads of state mm. all over the world. Fortunately, but still not enough. Because I am <laughs> absolutely convinced that if we had more women head of state, we would uh, be solving many of our pressing world problems in a different manner. So um, the World Economic Forum had done a, a, a survey mm. and named Iceland number one in closing the gender gap. Yes. So you have this history from starting even 1975. Yes. So what is the nature of the Icelandic women? And tell us about the company that you founded yes. named after one of the uh, Icelandic goddesses. Yes. We have, I feel very privileged to be born in a country with such strong women ever since Viking age. And I have been a big part of uh, bringing that change about. But I stand on the shoulders of these incredible women and these brave and courageous women who came before me. And I take that quite seriously. And I also lend my shoulders sort of for the next generation. So I've been part of trying to make a difference. So in 2007, 
at the height of uh, the financial bubble, if you will, in Iceland. Um, we came together, a group of women, and two of us initially, and then we brought other women around and founded an investment firm and decided to incorporate more feminine values into finance. And this was quite laughable at the times, on, uh, at the time, honestly, because we were supposedly doing so well and had enough banks that were growing fast and delivering unprecedented profits. But we felt it didn't seem sustainable to us. We didn't believe in it. And uh, we came together and decided to work from a different set of principles. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, the economic meltdown came about a year and a half later. And we went through it standing without taking any loss. You were the only company. Yeah, pretty much in the financial sector. All of our big banks went under, yeah. So it was a dramatic time. It was a complete meltdown of the financial sector. So we were at least one of the few that survived intact. And, um, and it caught a lot of attention. And of course, we believe it had a lot to do with our talented team of majority women. We had great men as well. But, uh, but more importantly, to our principles. Uh, we were very... Uh, committed to doing profit with principles, to um, to work from a different set of values than what we saw around. Would you describe those values, what you describe as feminine values? For yeah, and it's important to note that feminine values are something that both men and women can embrace. And as a matter of fact, we all have both feminine and masculine values. It's, it's a question of where do we draw from. And I'm absolutely convinced from personal experience, but research will support this, that the best leaders, they draw from both masculine and feminine principles in their work. Uh, so what we decided is that the financial sector just felt so overwhelmingly masculine. And there was so there was in our opinion an overdose of testosterone and there was a lot of herd behavior and we wanted to bring more balance into the sector by thinking not just about economic profit but also how we would make it and consider not just profit but also people and the planet so redefine the bottom line if you will we also wanted to do more straight talking we felt the sector threw around a lot of complicated language that very few people understood and sometimes not even the people using that language so we were very committed to speak speaking plain, simple, understandable language and telling our customers and people that there are no stupid questions, that the only stupidity is not to ask questions and things like that. Didn't you also not invest in things that you didn't understand? Yeah, sounds, uh, sounds simple, but at the time there were so many complicated financial products and we just did not want to be part of that. Unless we understood it and our customers, we would not invest. So... Um, you uh, you did a TED talk where you talked about these female values, and that was in 2010, I think. Yes. So how how are we doing now, six years later, <laughs> in your country, in our country, and in yeah. the world in general? How are those feminine values working in the financial? World? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, I ran for president for a reason this year. I really feel we haven't learned enough from what happened in 2008 in my country and around the world. And I think we have rebuilt the very things that failed us. And Einstein used to refer to that as insanity. And in my opinion, um, the only way we will ever create a more sustainable economy and more sustainable leadership at the helm at our companies and our, our municipalities, our countries, um, is by uh, having more women around the table. I'm not saying men are not doing well. It's just that we do so much better when we have both women and men around the table. And so I am absolutely convinced that if we want to avoid further um, disasters, like the one my country went through and the rest of the world, uh, we should really be focusing now on getting more women into positions of power everywhere. Well, you described um, uh, boards of directors of companies and, mm -hmm. and governmental boards. What's the difference between one, two, or three women? There's a huge difference, actually. I've been uh, very active in, in, in bringing around gender balance in the boardroom um, in Iceland and around the world. When we have one, she's a token, and the only option she has is to behave and, 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 and act the way that the majority culture does. So nothing changes. When we have two, it's a little bit better, but it's still a minority. When we have three, culture changes. The dynamics around the table completely change. It's about the gender balance. It's not enough to have one. 
And I am worried that many companies and many countries think it's enough when we have a woman, when we have a token, we have a sample of the other. That's enough to uh, satisfy the request for gender balance, but it's not. We need true balance. And on the opposite side, when we have only women around the table, we have other problems. I know that from being on a, a founder of an all-female company initially. So balance the other way is also important. Uh, it's, the, it's the balance of values, it's the balance of genders that I believe in. Um, so you mentioned that there's a 60-40 ratio and that you've got to have 40% men or six and 60% women or vice versa. Exactly. That it's got to be Balance is there according to the way we did it in Iceland. So the way we went about it in Iceland, we initially set voluntary targets. Uh, we got business leaders and government and women's organizations to agree that we would do it on our own, sort of voluntary targets. And we went from 12% women in the boardroom to 25% doing that. But that's not balance. So we introduced the legislation for um, gender quota in the boardroom. And now we have about roughly 43% uh, uh, women in the boardroom, and both men and women are showing a much higher appreciation for the dynamics and the culture and the corporate governance in the boardroom. The world is still reeling from the 2008 financial meltdown. Mm -hmm. I have been studying this all weekend. Um, what did Iceland do that was so extraordinary? And are you really the only country that prosecuted the bankers who made these drastic errors? I'm not sure if we are the only country, but I think there has been, we may have been the only one that set up a special prosecutor and, and went through uh, a pretty thorough process. Now that process does not come without casualties too. I mean, there's a lot of criticism in my country on that process too, but at least we tried really hard to learn something from it. Uh, the world likes to think that we did it all right, but I will set the record straight. We didn't do everything right, but we did have, maybe because of impossibility, the courage not to bail the entire size of our banks out. But the government did rebuild the banks and supported them and, and owns the majority of the banking sector in Iceland today. And we still have enormous challenges to work through in our country. But we are having economic growth. Uh, I think we have learned quite a bit, but in my opinion, not enough. Um, one example I will give is I am still convinced that we need to separate investment banks from retail banks. This has not happened uh, in, in Iceland or uh, around the world. And I think um, that's a very dangerous format to, to continue. And too big to fail is too big. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, so Michael Moore's latest documentary, Where to Invade Next, ends with a segment on Iceland mm. and on what you all did with the financial crisis. And mm. I do recommend that you, you have a lovely role in that. But he makes it kind of the, the, the climax, the crescendo of his work is about women and finances mm. and the difference it makes. Mm. So can you clearly articulate again what the main difference is mm. in uh, a woman's point of view as, as, a, as a caregiver, as a family mm. you know, mm. supporter, mm. as opposed to the male? Because I think a lot of men, they have a hard time with this. Yeah. Is it the difference between we versus me? Yeah. I think that that's a very, I, and I understand that people will have uh, challenges with this because uh, we always get a little bit defensive when we start talking women versus men, which is why I like to talk to, about feminine versus masculine, because both men and women can embrace feminine and masculine. It's not a, an either or uh, solution. We need both. So again, I want to emphasize that I don't th necessarily think women are better. But I do know that women typically bring different things to the table. And when we have both women and men around the table, we are more likely to discuss what I call a bigger definition of success, a, dif a bigger definition of the bottom line. And you know what's interesting? The bottom line gets bigger. So when we have gender balance, companies actually deliver a greater economic profit. So this is not a women's issue at all. It's an economic issue. But in bonus, we get social development that's very positive because typically when you empower women they do invest in something that has a, ha, has more than economic profit as its mission uh, they very typically embrace people and the planet to a greater level and and change uh, the mission of the companies that they sit on the boards of by doing that 
So it's not about women trying to take something away from men. It's actually about that if we embrace both women and men, we grow the cake for all. We're speaking today with Hala thomas Dater, and I believe it was this desire to manifest this that you chose to be to run for president of Iceland. Mm. And tell you, you, the election was just in June, and so this is still very fresh, and I know you're just starting to speak about it mm. now. But you went from 1% at the beginning to being the runner-up. Yes. So what, why <laughs> did you run, and, and what was that process like? Oh, it's probably been the greatest uh, and most challenging growth experience I've gone through personally and maybe even the people around me. But it was uh, um, an extreme, extremely challenging, but also extremely um, um, what should I say? Fruit. Uh, I mean, I, I personally experienced more growth than I probably ever have before. But the decision to run simply boiled down to one. I don't think we have learned enough, and I really do think we need a lot of change in order to create a world that I can leave for my children. I'm the mother of a son and a daughter, and I think I owe it to them and their generation and the generations that follow to try to be part of creating a world that makes sense and is sustainable. The other thing is I, I really have done a lot of challenges. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I have uh, taken on uh, changes in the educational sector, in the financial sector. I've been in corporate America. I've been an entrepreneur. And all of these uh, things, I've learned a lot from them, but I really believe that we need systems change now. So I thought, you know, I need to really try to run for a, a, an office and a platform that allows me to talk about that systemic change um, so that I really can try to be part of the solution and do good in this world as a leader. Um, when you detail the course that election took because you had the incumbent, yes, uh, just give us a thumbnail sketch of that. It was just, just <laughs> like... I don't know how you kept your head on straight. Well, it's a dramatic saga that, uh, that could probably make uh, um, for a good movie or, or a book. But we had, um, you know, in excess of 20 candidates initially, but the race ultimately boiled down to um, three men and, and, and me um, at the end. But our incumbent president had decided to step down, which is what gave rise to a lot of candidates. And then following the Panama Papers in Iceland and the resignation of our prime minister, he re-entered the race uh, to the surprise of everybody. And that was quite dramatic. Let's just uh, remind our viewers what the Panama Papers were. Yes. So that was a leak with uh, names of people who had done business through a Panama office to keep uh, basically assets offshore. And after the Icelandic uh, meltdown, um, we installed capital controls, not allowing any Icelander to move any of its money outside of the country. And then the people of Iceland learned through the Panama Papers that governmental and business leaders alike, a total of 600 of them, I believe, uh, were in these papers. And actually the name of the, uh, the president's wife and her family also appeared a few days after he entered the race. So he withdrew again from the race, uh, <laughs> making this even more dramatic. So it was, I, I think you're right, it was hard to keep my head on straight. And it was also very hard to get attention as a new candidate, a female candidate. So the media was so occupied with the people in power around this drama that those of us who were trying to run with a message for the future, uh, and I particularly, I think, suffered from it perhaps even a little bit more as a woman. It was very difficult to get the media platform to actually pay attention to um, my agenda, my message, uh, while all of this was going on. Some of the media you did get was extraordinary. There was an, an article in The New Yorker. Yes. And honest to goodness, can you, without blushing, repeat what they said about you? Well, I do blush when I say that, so now I'm going to blush on TV. But this is the after the election. So um, a New Yorker reporter came to Iceland to follow the, the, our new president and his wife. He was a personal friend, and he was following the elections. And he was watching the last TV debate, which was the night before election day. And for whatever reason, I came across to him, even speaking Icelandic, that he probably didn't understand, as not only the most sincere politician he had ever seen, but honestly, the most sincere human being he had seen. And he called me a living emoji of sincerity, <laughs> <laughs> which has to be uh, one of the strangest <laughs> things that I've ever heard anyone say about me. But perhaps he was referring to the fact that we are not very sincere and 
in the world of politics anymore and maybe we just need more of that because well, my I really defeated the polls that night so yeah. I think people want more sincerity yes they do and they also want that the the future the looking to the future and the vision thing yes. you know with that for lack of a vision the people perish yes and people really respond to a sincere vision absolutely we, we long for leadership and leadership is a lot about painting a, a, a better vision for the future and working from a set of strong principles and we don't see enough of that and i'm sorry to say that our presidential campaign in iceland was way too much in the rear rear mirror we were talking a lot about the financial crisis and the past, which is necessary because we need to draw learning from it. But we also need to look to the future and really talk about the kind of communities and the kind of world we want to be part of creating. That's needed now. But the Icelandic people themselves responded at the time of the of the financial crisis. These are, you know, reserved, dignified people. Talk about the kitchenware revolution. Yeah, it's, uh, well, after the financial collapse, I mean, that was probably the greatest shock our country has ever experienced. Icelandic people are very, um, they're not people who flock to the streets to demonstrate, but once 98% of our financial sector or something like that had collapsed, uh, you know, nearly over 90% of, um, um, uh, well, people lost as much as 80% of their savings, their house value was down, their mortgages were up. It was an enormous shock to our system and trust was seriously broken. So people took to the street with pots and pans to demonstrate. Um, and it's, uh, I smile uh, when I think about it because it was so unlike us, but really, I mean, people in Iceland were in shock and there's nothing funny about what happened and what happened when the panama papers came out eight years after this we relived that shock so trust was broken again and we do have considerable turbulence in our political states now as a matter of fact our current government um, we're having national elections now end of october uh, because people flocked to the streets again and demonstrated after panama papers um, so we have, um, we're still dealing with the emotional crisis, even if financially we may have recovered on paper from what happened in our country, the emotional crisis lingers and we have a lot of challenges to deal with. And I would not be surprised if Icelanders who lived through the economic collapse will be like the people in the U.S. that lived through your incredible crisis in 1930. Um, and thereafter, they will the never legacy, forget. The, the legacy, legacy will be there. still informs our, our, yeah. our culture. Yes, yeah. I think that's going to happen in my country as well. Um, but I'm hoping that we can turn all of that dramatic experience into more learning and more wisdom and more commitment to build a community that makes more sense for all. Because we have traditionally been a country of less wealth disparities than the rest of the world. Of, um, we've been a classless society. We've been a country that empowers not just its men, but uh, its women to a greater degree than any other country. We've been a, a country where men can be fathers as well as work away from home and where women can be mothers and also help professional challenging jobs. And I hope that we will use this opportunity to, to stay true to where we came from and um, and perhaps even be role models for the rest of the world in creating something something that makes more sense than um, the world we have created. It took a lot of courage and and risk awareness which you as a as a financial services person very aware of balancing risk and benefit but it took a lot of courage for you to do what you did. Um, what message do you have for our audience out there? Everyone mm. uh, you know Einstein's definition of insanity to do the same thing and expect a different result. We are doing the same thing mm. in, in terms of our financial, mm. but also personally call forth what our audience needs to think about to yeah. tap into that courage. Well, I don't know if um, it was courage or if it was maybe sometimes foolishness, but I just have a really hard time when I don't believe in things to, to, to stay quiet or stay um, or not be active. So what my message to anyone listening to this is um, we are all here to make a difference and we all matter and we all have far more power to make a difference than we embrace. So one advice I can give everybody is we can use the power of our purses, uh, the power of our investment muscles to bring about the change we want to see. Who we spend money with, which companies we do business with, um, 
who, uh, where we invest our money and how we do can be in line with the values and the world we want to see. So I encourage each and every person to think about the power that they have to be part of the change and the world we want to see, number one. Number two, I encourage people to let their voice be heard because there is no better wisdom out there than there is in there. So I think every single person should be unafraid to speak up about how we feel about things, not just what people are telling us, but how we feel about things. Because everywhere I go, I meet people that don't believe in the future of the state of um, affairs. And yet we continue to run around uh, without challenging that system. So it's time for not just me, but everybody to be part of the change. And so I call for every person to be a change catalyst in their own possible way. So uh, what does the future hold for you? What are you you're still recovering from the, uh, you know, that massive run for the presidency, and you're here in Santa Fe mm -hmm. as a guest of the Women's International mm -hmm. Study Group. Um, what else? What are you working on now? Well, I have started to write about the economic <sighs> meltdown and my run for the presidency. So I think at least as a first step, I want to, for my own good and perhaps for the good of others, try to share some of uh, what I have learned and my own experience. And it's a, been a positive experience. So it's not always easy to go against the herd, but it's definitely been a positive experience for me. And I want to hopefully inspire and possibly empower um, other people to, to join me because no one person can make a lot of difference, but together we can, just like the women in Iceland did on October 24th, 1975, when they collaboratively and collectively took the day off. They showed the world that we needed to change. Uh, what happens after that, I don't know yet. I'm going to give it a little bit of time before I decide, but whatever it will be, it will be about encouraging us to embrace gender balance, uh, as that is, in my opinion, the best way to create a more sustainable system wherever they are. Well said, well said. I want to thank, thank you. you for being with us today. Our guest today is Helen thomas Dotter, definitely a catalyst for change. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been my real pleasure, and I love Santa Fe. <laughs> and I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.